Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Taylor Ricketts. I'm the director of the Gund Institute here at the University of Vermont. And a colleague of Eric Zensi's for seven or eight years uh, after I arrived here at UVM. And I am really pleased to welcome you all to the inaugural award celebration and reading for the Eric Zensi Prize in Ecological Economics. Um, this prize, as I said, was just inaugurated last year and we're um, celebrating our first winner today. And it is a prize for the best book or long form journalism that uses the principles of eco ecological economics to understand current environmental challenges and the world around us. So the point of this prize is to help advance public understanding of ecological economics which is an approach to economics that's grounded in the realities of our planet and resource base. You'll hear more about that soon. And it honors Eric Zensi because he was a career long champion of ecological economics and in making it relatable and relevant to current issues and the wider public discourse. So we at the Gund Institute are really proud to be co-hosting this award with the US Society of Ecological Economics uh, it's been an honor to work with Eric himself and his wife, Catherine Davis, and his brother, Matt, and others to design this award and now implement it. And it's so important to us because it's core to what we do every day at the Gund Institute. We work holistically to understand and solve grand environmental challenges, and ecological economics is central to doing that. And it was central to the founding of the Gund Institute 20 years ago, and it's still just in our DNA. So <clears throat> we have quite a program here for the next 90 minutes. I'm personally just the MC, so I won't say much more. Uh, my job will be just to introduce speakers and move us through this program. But before we get to that, I just want to right off the bat acknowledge and welcome uh, this year's winner, who is Bathsheba DeMuth, author of Floating Coast. So can you just turn your camera on Bathsheba for a minute and say hello to us? Hello, it's so good to uh, see all of you out there and so far as I can see anyone. That's great. So Bathsheba is an environmental historian at Brown. She's author of The Floating Coast, which is the book that won this year. And we're gonna have a few other introductory remarks. So I just wanted to have Bathsheba say hello to all of you before other people speak first. We're really excited to, to get to her readings and Q&A. So the first person I want to introduce other than Bathsheba real quick right there is Matt Zensi, who is Eric Zensi's brother. And he's gonna talk a little bit about the Eric Zensi Prize in more detail and sort of the history and goals about it um, from the perspective of the Zensi family. So over to you, Matt, thanks for being here. Thank you, Taylor. I'm very glad to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about my brother's goals for the award that uh, you're administering there. And uh, I'm sure he'd be super pleased to know that it's going to uh, Bathsheba's book, The Floating Coast. Eric believed that ecological economics holds the key for, <clears throat> I'm sorry, hang on here. Whoops, wrong page, there we go. <laughs> My brother Eric Sensi created this prize because he felt we need to revolutionize how we think about economics. He believed we need that revolution because the prevailing economic way of thinking drives self-destructive exploitation of the planet, and also threatens our ability to sustain human civilization. This revolution in economic thinking can be summed up in two words enshrined in the prize that bears his name, ecological economics. So what is ecological economics? Eric described it this way, quote, at its most basic e ecological economics is economics as if the planet were finite and the laws of thermodynamics apply to us. In raising money to fund the award, he told donors, quote, my intention with this prize is to reward work that integrates the laws of thermodynamics into economic analysis that is put before the general public. He saw the prize as a way of continuing his life's work. His lifelong goal was to get these ideas out of the academy and put them to work in the world. He wanted to get them into the public conversation. Eric believed that ecological economics holds the key for dealing with many of our current ills. Environmental crises, of course, 
but also social and political ills, including the rise of right-wing populist authoritarianism and other um, adverse political trends in our uh, Western democracies. Those ills, he said, have a deep root in the failure of a perpetual growth economy to grow fast enough to satisfy all the claims made on it. And amid those economic failures, we have marg marginalized masses of humanity suffering. We have wealth concentrating with the 1%. And we have a once strong middle class becoming economically insecure. And all these growing resentments and fears drive fascism. Eric said, spreading the word about ecological economics is the most powerful thing I can think of doing to promote positive change, social change, political change, economic change, ecological change. That is why he created this prize, to continue spreading the word long after his death. Spreading the word, he said, is the most hopeful thing I know how to do. May his hopes ever be realized. Thanks. Thank you so much, Matt, and thanks for being so involved in the design and launch of this from the very beginning. Um, as I said, it's been quite an honor and a lot of interesting fun to be involved in that myself. So the next thing we want to do is uh, bring on Joe Roman. <clears throat> Joe Roman is a gun fellow, a fellow of the Gun Institute, an accomplished writer about environmental issues in his own right. And most relevantly right now, he was one of the co-chairs of the committee that selected the winner. So Joe's gonna talk a little bit about uh, that process and the outcome. Go ahead, Joe. Thanks, Taylor, and, and thanks, Matt. Uh, nice to see all of you again, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be with everyone this afternoon. So starting about, I'd say a year and a half ago, Josh Farley, who's the new president of the International Society of Ecological Economics, and I began, co-chairing the prize committee for, for the Zancy Award. Josh and I are both UVM Gund fellows and, and we both knew Eric well. We respected his work as an economist and as a writer and of course deeply miss him as a friend and a colleague. And we were both honored to support this prize. For this inaugural call, you know, you never know when you're first trying this out, how many submissions we, we were gonna get. It was very successful. Uh, we got 14 solid works, including five books and nine long articles. Um, Josh and, and Basil uh, thought, Basil Waugh thought that one way that we could approach that many um, projects is to develop a short list by teaching a class. So bringing on graduate students in ecological economics, meeting with them once a week, discussing what we read, and then ultimately rating them and, and thinking about which ones we thought should move on to the short list. Um, and I should acknowledge that the real leader here was Josh Taylor, who's a graduate student, and he he actually physically taught the class. Josh Farley and I were, were providing support in that regard. So we met weekly um, to discuss one or two readings until about a year ago when everything, as we know, uh, went sideways. And then eventually we, we met for the remainder of the semester online. And I wanna acknowledge um, Eva Kinnebrew as well, who helped throughout, as well as uh, Nora Shahood and Basil Waugh, who really helped each step of the way from the first announcements until today's webinar, they were essential. So out of those first submissions, we nominated three books. One was Ecological Footprint, Managing Our Biocapacity Budget by Mathis Wagner nagel and Bert Byers. The second was A Finer Future, Creating an Economy in Service to Life by Hunter Levin, Stuart Wallace, Anders Weekman, and John Fullerton. And then the winner that we're going to discuss today, Floating Coast and Environmental History of the Bering Strait by Bathsheba DeMuth. Unlike many of the entrants, the floating coast is different. Most of the entrants were normative or prescriptive. They really discussed how ecological economics could be used. Whereas um, Bathsheba's book, it got unanimous support, but it's looking at, it's much far more descriptive, beautifully written and a compelling subject matter that really we thought elevated it above the rest. And we passed those three on to the rest of the committee. Um, 
it's, it's just beautifully written, as I said. I was just looking today at um, Bathsheba's description of spring in Beringia, and it makes me think of outside today when things are breaking up, things are melting, um, really some, some compelling imagery, as well as casting a critical eye on both capitalism and socialism. To Muth and, and the Beringian, she gives voice to understand that growth, biological or economic, depends on death. And as she notes, in order to live something, some being is always dying. And amazingly, what Matt just said, she also talks about when energy is converted, there's always some loss. And as, as Bathsheba writes, the instinct of capitalism, communism is to ignore loss, to assume the change will bring improvement and to cover over death with expanded consumption. Bathsheba and the, the native Beringians she describes um, resist those views. And really, I think there's a lot of overlap between ecological economics and, um, and the Beringian worldview. She is, the, the book is steeped in indigenous oral traditions. And as Julia Phillips wrote in her review of Floating Coast in the New York Times, where people's voices do appear in the book, they're frequently in the form of direct quotes from Beringians, but no single person is given particular authority. One quote follows the next. The overall effect is of a chorus. At the beginning of the class we taught last year, we told the students that they didn't have to read all the books from front to back. It was for one credit after all. Just about everyone in the class said they had finished this book or intend to do because it was compelling and such a joy to read. No higher praise. Thanks, Joe. That was great. I've got similar sort of favorite lines from the book as well. Um, okay, so that's sort of the history of how we got to where we are now. Um, and now the last person I want to introduce before we get to hear at more length from Bathsheba herself is Robbie Richardson. He is the president of the U.S. Society for Ecological Economics. He's an ecological economist in his own right, a professor at um, Michigan State University, and actually currently on detail as a fellow inside the State Department in D.C., so um, he's going to talk a little bit about uh, the society um, and his interactions with this um, competition and with Eric. So over to you, Robbie. Thank you, Taylor. And uh, good afternoon to all of you who are participating in this event today. We've been very excited about uh, and looking forward to today. Uh, the United States Society for Ecological Economics is honored to collaborate with the Gund Institute for Environment at University of Vermont and the Zensi family to select the recipient of the Eric Zensi Prize in Ecological Economics. The Eric Zensi Prize in Ecological Economics celebrates long-form environmental writing, specifically outstanding writing on the environmental limits of our finite planet. Eric Zensi was an esteemed scholar and public intellectual who worked to understand and address the great environmental challenges we face. Eric was also a devoted member of the U.S. Society for Ecological Economics, and his contributions to the mission of the organization are still felt today. The criteria for the selection of the 2020 award of the Eric Zensi Prize include current affairs, book, or long-form journalism that's written for a general audience, that was published in 2018 or 2019, that addresses real world environmental challenges, that uses principles of ecological economics and is written in the English language. The Zensi Prize is awarded by Gund Institute for the Environment in collaboration with the United States Society for Ecological Economics. Um, as Joe mentioned in 2020, an award selection committee consisting of representatives from the Gund Institute the U.S. Society for Ecological Economics and the Zensi family reviewed several noteworthy nominations for the prize. Uh, the committee was unanimous in its selection to award the inaugural prize to the book Floating Coast, an environmental history of the Bering Strait by Bathsheba DeMuth. Other readers agree with our assessment. <clears throat> the Floating Coast was also the winner of the 2020 George Perkins Marsh Prize, and it was selected as the best book of 2019 by National Public Radio, Nature, Library Journal, Barnes and Noble, uh, and Kirkus Reviews, among numerous other awards. Dr. Bathsheba DeMuth is an environmental historian specializing in the lands and seas of the Russian and North American Arctic. She is Assistant Professor of History, Environment, and Society in the Department of History at Brown University. 
Her interest in Northern environments and cultures began when she was 18 and moved to the north of the Arctic Circle in the Yukon. For over two years, she mushed huskies, hunted caribou, fished for salmon, tracked bears, and otherwise learned to survive in the taiga and tundra of the region. In the years since, she has lived in and studied Arctic communities across Eurasia and North America. From the archive to the dog sled, she is interested in how the histories of people, ideas, places, and non-human species intersect. Floating Coast is the first ever comprehensive history of Beringia, the Arctic land and waters between Russia and Canada, exploring the relationship between capitalism, communism, Arctic ecology, and indigenous peoples over 200 years. The book explores the question, how under conditions of extreme scarcity would modern ideologies of capitalism and com communism control and manage the natural resources that are necessary to sustain and fulfill human life? This question is central to the foundations of ecological economics. So at this time, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to award the 2020 Eric Zensi Prize in Ecological Economics to Dr. Bathsheba DeMuth, author of Floating Coast, an Environmental History of the Bering Strait. Congratulations, Dr. DeMuth. I wish we could clap or something, uh, but I think obviously we can't, so I will do it on everyone's behalf. Um, so now we're finally gonna hear from Bathsheba, the time we've been waiting for. I just wanna say one quick reminder to people before we do, that we're gonna have a little bit of reading and then actually quite a long time for Q&A and discussion. So to prep you for that, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen to ask your questions and um, Joe will moderate those. So think of questions as you're listening and please um, use the Q&A feature to send them in. Over to you, Bathsheba. Thank you, Taylor, um, and thank you, Robbie and Joe, um, and a special thank you to um, Matt and Catherine, uh, Eric's family, for helping bring this award into the world. Um, it's a it's a real honor, in part because um, I think that this award speaks to issues that are, of course, incredibly pertinent to our future. Um, and also the, the kind of framing of the award is one that recognizes academics who hope that their work can speak uh, both to the intellectual communities that fostered it, but also to broader publics who want to participate in these issues and, and find them essential to their own futures um, is one that I really applaud. I think academics have many awards kind of within their own little worlds for the work that they do, and those are very important, but also uh, recognizing the, the broader publics that we serve um, is something that I take very seriously and makes this a particular honor to me, particularly given Eric's long tradition of doing that in his own life. Um, I've spent some of the last week with his work um, from his kind of fire branding, you know, discussions of D GDP um, and trying to kind of break down what that concept does and doesn't do for public to his personal essays that also blend a mix of history and really deep thinking about ecology and the economies um, that spring from the places that we live and work. I'd also like to thank the Gund Institute um, and the U.S. Society for Ecological Economics for hosting the prize and for, for choosing this book. Um, it is, again, a, a huge honor. Um, and a really surprising one actually for somebody who is trained neither as an ecologist nor as an economist. Um, I, I really come from a very traditional history department um, where I was trained in Russian history, uh, a, a discipline that I think many economists don't think has much to do with economies given that socialism is usually written out of um, at least many uh, kind of traditional economics departments. So this also feels uh, particularly meaningful um, in that sense, and thank you. Um, I wanted to spend just a little bit of time um, introducing you to what this book is and what it hopes to do and, and back that up with a couple of brief readings from it. Um, it's a project that 
kind of at its most basic or its most kind of view from 30,000 feet version is trying to find ways of using the kind of empirical tools of a historian that is going and looking through archives and through oral histories and other kinds of, of data from the past to provide narratives that allow us to think about how ecologies are always the place that economies begin, um, as opposed to the tendency that is very much reinforced in many kind of academic departmental spaces where social sciences and humanities are walled off from the worlds of the natural sciences to instead think about um, natural history and human history as really being one and the same. Um, and in doing so, this particular book looks at a part of the world um, where thinking about ecologies and economies in a comparative sense, it's kind of particularly, um, well, at least to me, was a particularly intriguing. Uh, the Bering Strait, which is where the United States and Russia almost meet, um, is ecologically quite a similar space. You have more or less the same kind of climate and species on both sides of the Bering Strait. Um, historically, the um, indigenous peoples of the Bering Strait go back and forth all the time. So it has great cultural continuity across that kind of corridor of 50 miles of ocean. Um, geologically, it's quite similar on both sides. So it's not a space that's separate unless you kind of fast forward to the 20th century when the United States and the Soviet Union divided into these two kind of economic regimes. Um, and that was the part that I found particularly intriguing as a historian, because into this Arctic and subarctic space, the Soviet Union tries to enact Soviet style socialism and the United States tries to bring American style capitalism. And the question to me was, what happens um, when these two ideological and economic systems arrive in the same ecological space and arrive in an ecological space that makes some of the really kind of core um, substances upon which these two ideologies operate difficult to come by. And that is agriculture is pretty tough that far north and even industry is, is challenging. It's cold enough. Um, that it's a difficult place to do the kind of big industrial projects that both the United States and the Soviet Union were interested in. So it's a good place to study what happens to economies when the ecology um, is one that's challenging to kind of their basic presumption. And in the, the case of this book, um, as I was working on it, I found that the basic presumption of both Soviet socialism and American capitalism was that you could always find more energy to use to feed your economic systems. And in the Arctic, this proved to be a bit of a challenge. But that is all kind of an, an abstract and, and relatively kind of bloodless way of understanding this particular history. And again, the thing that I really wanted to try to show readers is the way in which these big abstract ideas actually really come to live in specific places. Um, they're embodied, they're carried out through the actions of very um, you know, particular individuals and they take place within very specific kind of ecological spaces. So I, what I thought I would do now is read to you from um, the second section of the book, which deals with a species that both um, the United States and the Soviet Union come to find very valuable, the Pacific walrus. And the Pacific walrus is also a species that had long been really critical to um, indigenous peoples around the Bering Strait, the, the Yupik, the Nubiak, and the Chukchi. So it's a, a story of kind of many different kinds of people thinking of and interacting with um, the kind of particular species of the Bering Strait. Um, so I'm gonna read a little bit from um, the section on walruses. There is another kind of shore in Beringia, one in which the solid is not earth. Each winter, cold hardens the sea. Molecules lose energy, transforming liquid to solid. Ice crystals form, skimming the ocean's surface when the temperature drops to 28.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Wind and rising warm waters mix the crystals into suspension. As the cold deepens, crystals intertwine into a greasy film, thicken and become slush. Sometimes, ocean swells ball the slush into lily pads of ice. 
Sometimes the young ice rolls over the ocean's surface like an oil slick, still carrying enough brine to be elastic. Sheets of slushy ice slide and adhere to each other on the waves, condensing and exuding salt until all that is frozen is fresh. A terrestrial brink floats outwards over fluid water. It was these formations that Yankee captains feared, the slurry hardening around their ship's hulls, then turning solid and opaque. Slabs of yearling ice will build four, five, or six feet thick between October and May, hundreds of miles of sea covered over by a suspended coastline. The transitions of water from liquid to solid to liquid again set the pulse of Beringia's marine and coastal production. In the ice, colonies of algae shelter in briny pools, piecing together cells from the sunlight that glints through them. Krill graze these miniature marine pastures, even in the winter. In spring, as the floating coast draws back toward land, fresh water melts off the ice, spilling krill into the sea. Algae blooms in the sun, Waves plunge minute life downward, feeding clams, transparent shrimp, red-armed brittle starfish, and pale and eerie king crabs, on into schools of cod, halibut, pollock, and mackerel. Up come some of these creatures in the bills of diving ducks. Up come squid, their milky tissue caught in the mouths of bearded seals and walrus. Walruses were the second sort of energy that foreigners harvested in Beringia. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, commercial whalers killed walruses as a replacement for rare bowhead whales, taking yet more energy from the seas. Facing a deepening productive crisis, Anupiat, Chukchi, and Yupik killed foxes and traded their fur for flour, expanding the revolutions begun by whaling up onto the sea ice and out among fox dens, moving change from the sea inland. It was over these changes that the United States and the Russian Empire and then the Soviet Union tried what they had not tried to do with whales, to enclose the energies and peoples with sovereign borders. They did so out of recognition that commerce, without a state to contain it, extracted too much energy and traded back profit too minimal to bring any kind of civilization. The market could not be trusted to make all values. Beringians, the Yupik, the Chukchi, and the Inupiaq also found value lacking in the walrus trade and made their own borders and laws to shelter the herds from the restlessness of capitalism, from the quickness of its demands. The walrus themselves are coastline embodied. They cannot eat without the sea, feeding a hundred or more feet underwater where they root beds of clams and benthic worms from the mud but they must breed and birth in the air. So the herds slide and wallow in between, riding the edge of the sea ice south in autumn, then north through the Bering Strait in summer, sometimes leaving the ice to flop onto patches of sandy earth. Like whales, they concentrate rich seas in their bodies, over a ton for females, more than two tons for males. Walruses are not as fat as bowhead whales. The muscles they eat take their cut of the sunlight, but beneath inches of furrowed skin, a third of a walrus's body weight is blubber. They do labor that no person can, transforming submarine muck into useful tissue and hauling it to shore, drawing a line of energy from the sea onto the solid world. I'm happy to read a little bit more later on, um, but I, I wanted to introduce walruses because with the walruses, like many of the animals that end up being important in this book, comes one of the, the kind of central things that I, um, I ended up using to try to draw people into thinking about how economies rely on ecologies. Um, and that is the ways in which both the Soviet Union and the United States uh, came to the Arctic for energy. Um, and this is not a story of petroleum, um, which is kind of a classic Arctic um, extraction story but the ways in which both of these states with their kind of desire for more energy within their economies pulled it out of um, biological sources from whales, from walruses, from, from caribou um, and how these kind of had fundamentally transformative ecological impacts. Um, and in the case of the walruses impacts that actually both the United States and the Soviet Union chose to recognize and actually put some conservation measures into place. Although, that is not unfortunately the case with all of the, the 
animals that show up in this book. Um, and in the, the kind of long 200 year history that I, I tried to detail, although it is long enough and um, diverse enough that I feel like still I'm just scratching the surface in this 400 page book. Um, one of the things that I hope becomes clear is that in addition to these big ideological structures that come in from, um, from the Soviet Union, from the United States, um, the ways in which Yupik Anupiak um, and Chukchi understood the place that they lived in, their own economic forms, the, the politics of relating to the Arctic and subarctic, also remain um, kind of consistent, viable sources of, of value and ways of relating to the place. Um, they're not systems of thought or practices that are simply blotted out by the presence of these kind of colonial powers from the outside, but instead remain these kind of core and viable alternatives to thinking about how human beings relate to the places that they live in. Um, and I think, Taylor, is this where we open up to a QA? and a Yep. Hi. Thanks, Bathsheba, that was for that beautiful reading. Um, so we're going to, we have seemed to have one slight glitch here. The goal was for everyone to put it in the q and um, I'm getting some in the chat. I've got one in the Q&A. This isn't for you to worry about, Bathsheba. This is for us to worry about behind the scenes. But there are already some good questions lined up. So um, I'll just dive in with those. And uh, I may ask you some questions later, too. All right. Um, so one of the questions was, how did you first become interested in the peoples and landscape of the Arctic region at such a young age? I mean, it, what inspired you to move to the tundra as an 18-year-old? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, some of it is probably reading too much Jack London as a kid. Um, some of it was a general sense that I, I was really interested as a young person in writing and photography and maybe out of a lack of imagination, I felt like I didn't have a lot of material in my little town in Iowa. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to go somewhere I had really romantic kind of adventure ideas on the brain um, and planned kind of a gap year, the first stop of which was in this village of Old Crow in what's now the Yukon, um, which very rapidly disabused me of the romantic notions um, because you know that that's not actually how the Arctic works. Um, but I also completely fell in love with it. Um, so it was a, uh, um, it was a real gift in a lot of ways because my my job was to train a sled dog team for an indigenous family, which meant really just sort of settling into what a 20th and 21st century subsistence life looks like um, in the far north. Um, I think I say in the beginning of the book that I had to be taught how not to die, um, and that's really not hyperbole. I didn't I didn't know most of the kind of really basic things about um, how to conduct myself um, and. I think that those lessons of understanding my own person as subject to the whims of what the bears were doing and what the caribou were doing and what my dogs wanted to do um, and what the weather was up to, as well as kind of settled, being settled within this community um, were really critical to how I've thought about history and, and my work ever since. Amazing. What can you describe a couple of the changes that you've seen since your first trip? there? Yeah, I think one of the um, one of the striking things about having now kind of two decades of, of relationship with a place in the Arctic is that um, some of the impacts of climate change that are sort of just starting to arrive in more temperate parts of the world have really been a lived experience there more or less since I arrived. Um, I remember being told that I was in the last generation of people to experience winter um, as is normal, right? The, the winter that is in my um, historical documents that I read about, the kind of severity of the temperature, um, for the most part, doesn't exist anymore or exists in a much diminished form temporally. Um, and so there is there is just the fact that things are warmer, the summers are warmer, there are more forest fires, um, particularly in Russia the last couple of years. Um, and then there have also been some really dramatic changes, mostly to do with um, melting permafrost um, in, in the part of the, the Yukon that I got to know really well. There were a couple of lakes that I would regularly run my dog team across in the winter. 
and I went back up a couple of years ago um, and we were out in what should have been the same place as these lakes and it had you know a stand of willows and alders that were you know a couple feet high and I was so confused because like did I did I forget where there was supposed to be a lake and I had not forgotten it had just drained um, the the kind of ice wall that had been holding one side of the lake in place had melted away and all the water had run out um, and now it's kind of a basin that's that's growing up so some some of the changes are really physical and immediate um, and some of them are kind of more creeping things like the winter is just being slightly less colder year over year. Thanks. How about you started with talking about walruses. How about the walrus populations and the, the walrus hunt? So the walruses um, in some ways are a conservation success story or a success story of modern economies recognizing limits. So um, in the 1970s, the United States and the Soviet Union had a, a treaty agreement that basically reduced any kind of commercial or large scale harvesting and walruses were kind of only for indigenous hunting. Um, and as a result of that, the population really rebounded. It was back into the kind of quarter million walruses that the, the North Pacific usually sees. Um, and right now walruses are in a, in a kind of category of Arctic animals where there's just a giant question mark. Um, they are ice adapted critters. So they spend a lot of their time sitting on the sea ice. That's how they get access to what they eat. It's where they give birth. They're really social animals. So it's also like the site of their society in a really critical way. Uh, and of course, the sea ice picture in the far north um, has changed so dramatically um, in the last 20 years and, and frankly has changed dramatically in the last five. Um, right now, there's shipping traffic going north of Russia um, it like goes through the Bering Strait and heads toward Europe, north of Russia in March and February, which shouldn't be possible, um, historically speaking. So this means that where walruses are able to feed is changing. It means that they spend a lot more time on land um, rather than on the sea ice. Um, right now their populations are fine. Um, what, what the long-term picture is, as with caribou and, and other Arctic um, really Arctic adapted animals and particularly the sea ice adapted animals is a, is a big question. Um, Thank you. Um, so one question comes in said, it's beautiful writing. Thank you for reading. You mentioned uh, Jack London. Have you read Farley Mowat um, who also wrote a great deal about the North? And if so, what do you think of his books? Yeah, so I've read uh, quite a bit of Farley Mowat. I actually think my dad read me Farley Mowat aloud when I was a kid, so he might actually fall also in the category of responsible, <laughs> along with Jack London. Um, and I think Farley Mowat has a really interesting place, in some ways, in this book around the edges um, and in in writing about the North more generally. Um, he's not particularly well regarded by the indigenous folks I've spent time with. Um, they call him hardly know it. Um, mm. It's kind of a, a joke and a, in a good natured way. And like, you know, he didn't really get it right, but we saw what he was trying to do. Um, but he also had a long friendship with um, a Chukchi author, um, an indigenous um, man from the Russian side of the Bering Strait named Yuri Ritheu. Um, and they had a long co correspondence um, and Farley Mowat was actually very important in getting um, uh, Yuri Ridheu's work translated into English originally, as I understand it. Um, and so, you know, he has a, I think he has a complicated place in the kind of pantheon of, of outsiders writing about the North, but certainly has inspired, you know, many folks to pay attention to it, uh, to pay attention to caribou and whales in particular. Um, Great, thanks. Um, another another comment, wonderful reading, thank you. I wonder if your approach to history has intersected with the big history synthesis, particularly the work of David Christian, a fellow Russian historian. If so, has big history influenced your research and writing? That's a really excellent question. Um, I think, I mean, I, I teach some of the big histories uh, to undergrads. Um, and I think it can do some really interesting work um, in understanding the ways in which human societies do have some, some similarities with each other and that you can, you can draw some commonalities about 
um, you know, for example, things that if societies do them a lot, it tends to lead them toward collapse, um, which I think was Christian is often kind of invoked in that, in that space. Um, I think in another way, what I do is fairly distinct um, in that partly just as a question of scale, not necessarily in an argumentative way, um, but this is a book that's really located in a particular ecology um, and draws upon that ecology to understand how it is that people are able to make kinds of livings there. Um, and I don't necessarily see it as a universal model, right? And in some ways the argument of the book is that those universal models don't work ecologically, right? The, the ecologies of different parts of the world are distinct enough um, that human societies cannot just sort of um, abide by a particular set of rules. And I think because of the scale of big history, it sometimes operates more at the, you know, here are the big trends we see rather than here are the particular substantiations of people, you know, trying to make socialism amongst walruses. Um, so in some ways we're just making different interventions, I think. Um, I do think kind of the turn toward big history is really interesting just in terms of the moment we're in. Um, I think it comes out of um, an increasing concern that I see amongst my, my fellow historians and certainly with the students I teach about understanding past moments of really kind of acute social change or the need for social change, like what actually provokes it? Are there some laws or rules or trends that we can observe in the past that would help us get some sort of handle on what the future would look like. Um, so I, I'm as interested in big history as to what it says about our own preoccupations as a sort of about the specifics, because I think it um, it comes out of a similar set of discussions as thinking about the Anthropocene, for example, that, you know, what, what do we do with this moment we're in? Can we learn something from the past about how to, to manage it? Great, thanks. Well, so someone asked a very drilling down, um, do you, if you had any thoughts on spoon-billed sandpipers and the role of sustainable ecological tourism in Beringia in general? I don't know if you know that particular ex example, but if not, talk more broadly. So this is such a tough question for me um, because tourism is often, particularly in parts of the North that have been home to extractive industries in the past. So places like Nome, um, places like Dawson City in Canada, um, tourism is an alternative to continuing to participate in those industries. And it's often an alternative that is far more um, desired by local communities who are not necessarily interested in, in hosting extractive industries again. Um, there's a lot of discussions going on in, in Canada right now and in Alaska and to some extent in Russia, although having these conversations is more complicated in Russia. Um, about things like gold mining and zinc mining and lead mining, which are, you know, industries that come with boom towns and industries that come with lots of pollution to waterways and all sorts of other concerns. And so tourism can be a real um, kind of answer to that, right? It can give people, particularly indigenous communities that want to kind of maintain a tie with their homelands, it can give them access to cash while also kind of being embedded in the place they want to live, which is a great good. Um, the difficulty is that getting to these places and getting around in them is very fossil fuel intensive. And so there's a lot of concern, I think, both on the part of many tourists who are interested in, in going to these kinds of places who are often kind of ecologically minded folks um, and with the communities themselves about how to do this in a way um, where it's not actually just relying on extraction somewhere else, right? <laughs> relying on fossil fuel extraction. Um, and I think that that's part of a bigger question in our society more generally about how we move around and how much moving around is acceptable. Um, but I, I can say, you know, for, for people I know who are participant in the tourism industry, that it can be really, um, you know, it can have some real benefits and it's certainly kind of more sustainable in terms of the social dynamics that come with it than the kinds that come in with other extractive industries. That's actually a nice transition to the next question, which is, um, I've been thinking a lot about accumulation by degradation lately, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts around climate change and so-called opening of the Arctic. How does climate change open up new regimes for extraction and accumulation in this region? What are the consequences for the ecologies and peoples of the region 
Um, and there, are there ways in which the Arctic might resist these new regimes? That's a really great question. Um, and I should preface this by saying that I'm a historian. So in some ways, my expertise stops a little shy of the present, let alone the future. Um, but I, I think one thing that was very striking to me when I was doing the research for this book um, and in conversations subsequently is how the, the current changes in the Arctic, which I do not want to minimize because they are they are dramatic and they are scary to observe, um, they're sad to observe, also come in a long line of other really dramatic ecological changes that have been brought on uh, by folks from the South coming in and wanting something from the Arctic. Um, in this case, it's folks from the South wanting things in large scale and not even going to the Arctic that's changing it because it's it's because of fossil fuel emissions. Um, but, you know, people up, up there tend to put it in, in line with commercial whaling in the 19th century and other kinds of things that really rearranged the, the species that they interact with, the homelands that they protect, um, and kind of, it's, it's one and another kind of slew of insults. It's just one that might be uh, harder to kind of return from, um, and one that has really global kind of consequence in terms of what starts in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic in a climate sense. Um, and with that is uh, a set of concerns that are really playing out in real time about what particularly increased shipping will mean in the North, um, at least around the Bering Strait. Those are a lot of the conversations that people are having. Um, the, the Northeast Passage or the Northern Sea Route, which connects Asia to Europe by going north of Russia, um, will very soon be kind of a, a regular summer route um, it spares you going through the Suez Canal, which is expensive and slow. Um, but that means suddenly there's going to be, you know, large scale shipping traffic going through the Bering Strait, um, which means there are going to be large scale shipping traffic going through the waters that bowhead whales swim in and where walruses are and all of these species that have, you know, dealt with people but have not dealt with tanker ships at scale. Um, and that's a real concern for um, you know, basically anyone who has anything to do with sea mammals, but particularly for sea mammal dependent native communities, because they know that the, the noise from ships and shipping is really hard on um, mammals that communicate with each other underwater, um, and that ships run into whales in particular, right? Um, it's why, you know, North Atlantic right whales are going extinct in real time in the in the Atlantic uh, near where I am because they are run into by ships so often. So I, I think that set of concerns about the animal life is really acute. Um, and then what happens if you essentially have a series of port towns um, along the Bering Strait and in Arctic communities in Northern Canada and Alaska and, and Russia, um, because like the sorts of towns that spring up around extractive industry, Port towns are socially complicated places, right? They're, they tend to be overwhelmingly young and male um, and full of people who are, you know, desperate to have a social life when they briefly get off their tanker ships. Um, and they can introduce some really tough variables um, for, for people who live there full time. Um, and with that, if, you know, is the kind of trailing question of how much more accessible are the minerals and fossil fuels that are in the Arctic if there's less ice. Um, so all of these kind of geopolitical questions, I think, are very much on people's minds. Um, and there's, you know, you can see the really, the coordinated and sustained efforts to assert indigenous sovereignty in the face of those. Um, if you think about the, like, 40 year long discussion about drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, um, which was okayed by the Trump administration kind of <laughs> in the actual 11th hour of the Trump administration, um, but has sort of faced so much pushback that, you know, major banks don't support drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And that's because of lobbying from Gwich'in and, and Inupiaq um, communities that don't want this kind of industry. Um, and I think that trend of um, communities kind of realizing that they need to speak to the nation states that, that have control in some ways, but also need to speak to consumers um, and other kind of, you know, institutions that have power like banks um, in order to kind of assert rights um, and control over their homelands is, 
is one that's increasingly effective, um, particularly in the United States and Canada, um, because the oil companies won't drill if they can't get loans. So, you know, I think it, to me, that's, that's kind of one of the central uh, focal points of kind of where the Arctic is now is, is figuring out these questions. Um, and it will be really interesting to see with a new administration what happens in Alaska. Absolutely. You, you started off saying you weren't sure to answer that because you're a historian, but clearly that, that you just gave a good reason why you need to know the history because you get <laughs> lots of information on, on the concerns going forward. Um, and, you know, I, I work on whales, so I'm, I'm also concerned about the movement of those ships going. Right. Into yeah. Um, well, why don't we take a minute, why don't, if you have something else for uh, to read, we have a few more questions lined up, but we'll move on to that after you give us another nice reading, please. Sure. Um, I think I will do this one from the end of the book. Um, and this is kind of thinking back to, to being in the Yukon, kind of when I first went, went north. The ravens called to us from shore in the autumn, out on the river to pull up the salmon nets. It was on the river, my hands in the fish gore, that my hosts explained, patiently, for I was young and not disposed to think of endings, that I was likely in the last generation to see this river, to fish these salmon in this way. Salmon are trawled aggressively at sea and they do not like warm water. The 20th century had just ended, but in the Arctic, change was already imminent. I had come by then to love a place that could kill me in a moment's carelessness. And it was also a place that I, in the course of living the life that I knew as normal, the life of engines and electric lights was helping to erode. I remember looking out over the tundra. There is a particular light where the sun comes down bright through the clouds on a far hill in a bloom of green. It is like a thousand other moments where the sensory immediacy of the North cuts to the quick the crackling spark sound of the spruce fire starting in a canvas tent on a morning so cold, everything touched by breath is rhymed in frost. The loamy smell of the air among great whale jaws where they crumble into a beach, some ripe with recent death, others chalk white with age. The sound of a caribou exhaling in panic before the gunshot. The mouthfeel of bowhead, the raw black skin crunching slightly, the fat dense and springy or the thrum of fear behind the breastbone when the bear lifts her head from among the willows. To live here is to be very clear on the depths of the flesh. There I was lifting fish from the river to make them into food with mussels fed on caribou and berries. There I have been since, hands slippery with walrus fat or cooking the gray whale that fed me one summer for a week. That is the contradiction of existing in Beringia. In order to live, Something, some being, is always dying. As in the Nupiak legend, where the raven takes the sun from the falcon and they fight, battling a pattern of dark and light into the land and the sky. Looking at this, raven concludes that there cannot only be light or only life. Such a world would be sterile. There is no exit from this contradiction. Humans are of places. We sit deep in them and cannot help but change them. To be alive means taking up our place in a chain of conversions. It is not optional. We are embarked. But to where? Scale matters in such things. Foreigners introduce new scales, shortening the horizon of imagined time to the next sale or the next economic plan, while expanding the gauge of appetite. A hundred whales become a thousand or 10,000. More harvest in the short term would bring the promised land sometime next year in a decade while separating the act of living, of consuming, from dying. Some ways of imagining the future require more energy than others, and the industrial enlightenment was particularly covetous. Fossil fuels freed the use of energy from human toil, allowing human history to seem separate from the rest of time. It wrote concern for cyclical life out of most calculations of value, Cycles, after all, have a peak and a decline, a season for birthing and for dying. They invoke mortality. Ideas of ever-increasing growth emphasize the life phase, as if we as a social body are permanent adolescence, hungry and rising, immortal. This made possible a new idea of liberty, released from the constraints of the matter that made us, 
and from the precariousness of being. Absolutely gorgeous. Thank you, Sheila. Um, my um, co-chair, Josh Farley, had a question for, for you. He said, I loved your book. We have trouble imagining alternative ways to organize our societies, economies, and relationships to the natural world. Many ecological economists and others are looking towards indigenous cultures for lessons. There's no doubt considerable romanticizing of indigenous cultures, which vary wildly. But has your experience working with diverse cultures and economies suggested any insights into how we can develop a more just and sustainable ecological economy at a national or global scale? That's also a really good question. Thank you. Um, and I think that, that prefacing that with talking about how indigenous cultures are extremely plural <laughs> um, is, is really important because I, I cannot speak for any of them as one of, as an indigenous person. And I certainly don't want to lump um, the, the kind of diversity that just in North America is quite astounding under the, the kind of one term indigenous. Um, what I can say from, from the Bering Strait um, are a couple of things. I think first, um, it's very important to not romanticize um, in, in the way that there's kind of a colonial tradition of imagining that indigenous folks were kind of so harmonious with the world that they lived in that they never changed it and had no politics and had no economy. That, that's a kind of ideological position that comes out of trying to assimilate and, and colonize people, right? It's a, it's a violent position of romanticism. But I also think it's not important to so overcorrect that we forget to pay attention to what the politics and economies that pre-existed, in this case, you know, Soviet socialism or American capitalism actually looked like. Um, as I think sometimes we can go too far in the direction of kind of turning everyone into a homo economicus or a homo sovieticus and actually forget about how powerful that plurality is. Um, and to me, one of the really exciting things about historical work is that it kind of lets you spend some time with these other um, ways of imagining social lives in the past and that continue into the present. And the thing that is continually striking to me, both in the historical record and when I spend time up north with native communities is the degree to which um, the idea that nature is a thing that you are there to take from is completely not operative, right? Nature is obviously the thing that you live in and are part of. And if you are extremely lucky and have been doing a good job at being a human being, it will give you enough to keep being a human being and doing well at that job. Um, so it's a it's a world in which the you know that the animals and the plants and the weather itself are giving you what you need rather than you kind of mastering it and taking from it. Um, and it's a very different kind of orientation toward the ecology that you live in, right? Um, that it's, it's a set of gifts that you are responsible for reciprocating and participating in um, and reciprocating by, you know, a variety of actions, right? From the ones that I think many people are familiar with, like you know, not wasting the whale that you kill to eat, right? Making sure that you you use all parts of the animal, um, but also that you give enough of that whale to the people in your community that can't hunt, um, that they too can eat from it, right? It's not, um, it's a set of rules that, that come from a relationship with whales or with caribou, but include human moral actions within that world. So, you know, you are, you are judged if you don't give part of your, the moose that you killed to the elders in your community or to the pregnant women in your community. Um, and you're judged if you don't do the same with the whales. And the thing doing the judging is the whales and the moose. Um, it's not just the other people around you. So it's a much more kind of capacious understanding of where morality exists and comes from. Um, and at the end of the day, it's just less arrogant. Um, and it makes a great deal of sense if you've spent any time in the North, right? The the world that's around you is so very clearly just not there to serve your needs. It's one where you really have to kind of master its own vocabulary in order to even like just stay alive in a very basic sense. Um, and I think that kind of orientation, one that that takes seriously 
human fragility as opposed to trying to ignore it um, is, in, is important. And it, it makes you more conscious of what it is that you're consuming. Um, and it makes you conscious of yourself as a consumer in some ways that we kind of are able with our Amazon two day delivery and other things to kind of just, just turn into a background noise rather than something that's deeply participated in and kind of sustaining of not just ourselves, but our whole social world. That, that actually you've answered the next question about consumerism, I think so well. So I hope um, Bob Herendine, you'll, you'll, you'll pardon me if I, if I go on that, because I think you, that, that covers it nicely. Um, one question for, says, former President Trump, as negative as he may have been, did bring more media and public attention to Alaska and the Bering Strait during his run. I've heard now that although the Biden administration is clearly more focused on the preservation of Arctic ecologies and communities, the lack of attention being drawn to the area relative to the Trump administration has allowed other players, such as the Russian Navy, to encroach further into U.S. economic zones in recent months. Do you think this trend will continue and can the Biden administration live up to their goals for this term? That's a great question. Um, and I think the, you know, the kind of the geopolitical question about what is going to happen in the North is a really interesting one. Um, the, the US has never had a particularly sophisticated um, kind of military presence after the Second World War in the North. I mean, we have military bases in, in Alaska, but they were often focused on delivering missiles rather than on kind of patrolling the coastline. Russia has a much, much more Arctic adapted Navy. Um, I think we have three operative icebreakers in the United States right now, um, and one of them which is often working in Antarctica, um, whereas, you know, Russia has a fleet um, of these kind of ice uh, safe ships. So it's pretty easy to encroach if you're Russia. Um, and I think probably pretty tempting in some ways because the, historically the encroachment has gone in the other direction. It's been the United States, um, you know, the whalers and the walrus hunters um, and folks like that who were, who were in Russian territory or territory that Russia claimed um, without permission and often without any sort of good graces from the czars or the Soviets. So um, I think there's also a certain desire to kind of correct for or overcorrect for that, that history, which is very much on the minds in Russia, even if it's not something that Americans pay attention to. I also don't think that Russia has any interest in actual conflict around the Bering Strait, right? It's bad for shipping and they are really interested in having a, a, a thriving Bering Strait shipping industry. Um, the fees that they're able to levy, you know, they're gonna keep them lower than the Suez Canal, but they're still pretty substantial. Um, it's a way of offsetting Russia's dependency on, on oil in some ways, um, even though it's also an oil dependent industry. Um, so I don't think the conflict, like open conflict is, is very likely. Um, I do think it leaves, um, you know, if you're living on the Bering Strait, your sense of whose ship might sail into harbor is a little bit more open. <laughs> um, and I also think it, it shows just the really different priorities between the Biden administration and the Trump administration. Um, and the Biden administration thinks that climate change is a national security issue and is putting a lot of emphasis behind trying to draw down carbon emissions in order to treat that. And the Trump administration's understanding of national security was much more kind of just, you know, project power into places with large objects. Um, and that those are just really different ways and therefore experienced really differently on the ground. Um, I thank my colleagues for giving me the chance to ask all these great questions, <laughs> which I could think of them all myself. Um, so here's one more um, about you. Um, I read that you joined the Peace Corps after your undergrad at Brown. Did your PC experience influence your future career path? And if so, how? Yeah, so um, it did very much, although perhaps not how the Peace Corps intends it. Um, I, I don't know if the Peace Corps has an intention, but. Um, what I realized, my husband and I were posted to Moldova, which is a formerly part of the Soviet Union. It's a little country between Ukraine and Romania. Um, and I had just done a master's in international development at Brown. So I was you know, thinking about these you know, big models of how societies change. 
um, and roll into the former Soviet Union, not knowing very much about Russia. I hadn't studied, you know, Soviet history as an undergraduate um, and was immediately struck by, on the one hand, how similar the aspirations of the Soviet Union felt in the sense that they were kind of coming in from the outside, they were kind of a colonial presence in Moldova, trying to absolutely transform people's daily life. So it felt to me, in some ways, like echoes of what Old Crow had felt like, except what the Soviet Union was trying to do was transform kind of peasants, as the um, the folks in Moldova had been, um, into industrial farmers and industrial workers more generally. Um, and their models for doing that, of course, looked completely different. The built environment was not at all familiar. Um, you know, the kind of, I was totally fascinated with Soviet architecture because it, you know, obviously has all these modernist kind of aspirations um, and at the same time looks very different, um, thinks about communal space very differently in that, that it emphasizes communal space at all. Um, so it was, it was in the Peace Corps that I first started thinking about socialism really seriously. Um, and and then I realized that if I was interested in the Arctic and I was interested in socialism, that I should probably study Russia um, because Russia has a lot of both. <laughs> um, so that was that was actually kind of what led me to um, do a PhD in Russian history. Great, thanks. Um, do you have something else you'd like to read for us? Or would you want us to, to maybe ask a few more questions? Uh, any... Maybe a few more questions. And if we have time, I can do yeah. another reading. Sure, sounds good. Um, so how did you first become interested? I think you really kind of answered this, but how did you become interested in the peoples and landscapes of the Arctic at such a young age? I think we've we've really kind of handled that one. So let's go to, to Taylor's question. Um, were you aware of ecological economics as a field and its main arguments before or while writing this book? Or is this a case of convergence of ideas and resource limitation, et cetera? So this is really a story of convergence. Um, I, I did not know about the field of ecological economics. Um, I've actually come to know it since arriving at Brown because I teach in part um, in the environmental studies program here and we're in a kind of ongoing struggle to hire an ecological econo economist. Um, but I'm sure as all of you in that world know, it's not necessarily one that um, people of a more traditional economic bent understand at all. <laughs> so it's, I've actually been in a lot of conversations about the field since, since coming here. Um, I think, interestingly, this book was, um, it's not even that I didn't know about ecological economics. When I went to grad school, I didn't even know that environmental history was a field. I had a set of questions that was kind of preoccupying me and had been preoccupying me about the, the relationship between kind of people and where they live um, that originated with my first years in the Arctic. Um, and I didn't know that there was even a historical field um, that dealt with them. So I, I went to grad school to be a Russian historian um, and then kind of stumbled across um, environmental history in grad school at a program that didn't have an environmental historian on the faculty. So in many ways, I wrote this in isolation from all the likely fields. Um, but I also think there's something really exciting about the fact that, you know, coming out of very traditional historical training, you know, kind of thinking about the world in nation state boxes and, you know, thinking about big ideological changes, um, that coming out of that background, um, the, the kind of nature of the questions that people are asking right now mean that I can produce a work that's actually in dialogue with or speaks to some of the same questions that are in fields like ecological economics. I think it speaks to, um, nothing about me in particular, actually, but speaks to kind of the, the place we are socially in a way that is quite inspiring, um, that we can, we can head in this direction. Um, and it gives me great hope that there is a field of ecological economics, because it seems um, having had slightly more exposure to an econ department here than I did in grad school, really important. Um, and one that, a field that my undergraduates, um, you know, are desperate to take classes in. Um, which also gives me great hope. I can hear my colleagues saying, hear, hear. <laughs> so that's nice to hear that. Um, Taylor asked, the idea of energy transformation from sunlight and sea worms to walrus bodies to local and global economies, it's effective and beautifully written. Um, where did that frame and device come from? 
Did you have it going in or did it reveal yourself during your research? I really wish I'd had it going in because I spent, um, I had been doing archival research basically nonstop for a year and a half before I had a sense of this being the structure. Um, and uh, like really was lost most of the time. It was a, <laughs> it was a very bewildering year and a half. Um, and, and where the, the kind of, the, the use of energy as a way to kind of pull the, the big themes of the book together came out of um, sitting with the sources and archives and conversations I'd had with people um, about a project that when, when I started it, I thought I was gonna begin with the Russian revolution. Mm -hmm. Um, kind of begin at the moment when the Bering Strait really gets divided between these two ideologies. It seemed very tidy. And so I had gone about researching that way. And of course, in the process had looked, you know, prior to the revolution, because you need to know what was going on there. And every kind of source that I looked at from, you know, oral histories to histories in the Russian imperial period to early Soviet histories to, you know, people's diaries from Alaska, everybody was saying, you like wailing, it's wailing that is where this kicks off. And so I was like, okay, I guess I, you know, we're gonna pull this story back into the 19th century. Um, it was a very terrifying moment. I had not been to the New Bedford Whaling Museum. I hadn't been thinking about the East Coast of the United States in this project at all. Suddenly there it is. Um, and then I realized in thinking about sort of the ways in which whaling was important, that whaling was important because it was an oil rush people were coming to get energy out of the, the Bering Sea. Um, and then I realized that all of these other things that I had been reading about were also about extracting energy. Um, and they not only were about extracting energy, they started where the energy is in the ecosystem the most concentrated in the north, which is at sea. So they start with these bowhead whales that are, you know, they're almost 50% fat by volume. They have an enormous amount of biological energy in them. And then they move out to walruses and kind of up onto the coastlines. And so I realized that the colonization itself was, was following the energy in space. Um, and that's when I realized that the, the kind of structure of this book could be part of the argument in a sense that um, the, the kind of temporal drive behind um, both Russian and American movements into the Arctic follows this, this spatial story of how different ecosystems produce energy. Thanks. So, so you, colonization, as you noted, follows the energy. Um, and as you've said, and uh, so the US and has closed down commercial whaling as of the 1970s. And in fact, there's a ban on all hunting of marine mammals, except for subsistence harvest. So um, can you talk a little bit about how you've observed your relationship with a subsistence harvest, especially you've mentioned whales quite a bit. So can you give us some description of being, being there? Yeah, so whaling um, is regulated by the International Whaling Commission. Um, that includes sort of an industrial scale whaling, which is now prohibited, although some countries still do it, particularly the countries that have left the International Whaling Commission like Japan. Um, and then, around the Bering Strait, both in Russia and the United States, indigenous villages have quotas of whale strikes that they're allowed every year. Um, so attempts at whales. Um, and it's mostly bowhead whales in Alaska and mostly gray whales in Russia. Um, although in Russia, some, some bowheads are killed each year, just a few. Um, and it's it has been kind of through this entire period of historical upheavals, whale hunting and walrus hunting have remained really critical, you know, both in just a caloric sense and in a, in a cultural one. Um, and in the US today is, is a really important food source um, in, you know, communities all around the Arctic Rim. In the United States, those communities are really underserved by state and federal services. Um, they're not places where it's easy to feed yourself unless you have access to, um, to wild foods. Um, I, I budget like 40 or $50 a day just to feed myself if I'm there. So if you're imagining trying to feed a family of people um, out of the local grocery store, um, it's kind of a mind bogglingly expensive venture. So there is just like a very kind of first order material need um, that, is, that is filled by whale hunting. But of course that doesn't even touch the ways in which continuing these practices is just a critical part of maintaining 
um, and giving these traditions to the next generation. So they are, um, I mean, to me, they're some of the most important events that happen in these communities on a yearly basis. Um, there's a lot of concern now about changing whale migration routes because of the sea ice altering, particularly for bowheads, where bowheads are in space and time has kind of shifted over the last decade. Um, and on the, the Russian side where most folks are eating gray whales, um, there's a lot of concern that in the last decade, more whales are showing up um, who um, have kind of, their, their meat tastes like iodine. It has a really strong um, flavor to it. Sometimes it's so strong you can actually smell it when they exhale. So hunters won't, uh, won't go after whales when they smell this kind of weird medicinal um, smell. No one's quite sure where this is coming from. If it's something that that gray whales, which you know migrate all the way from Baja up the, all the kind of edge of the Pacific, if they're picking it up somewhere in route. Um, and in general, there's a lot of concern about gray whale health kind of going down over the last decade or so. Um, but other than that, it kind of it remains kind of a really critical um, practice and food source in all these communities. Thank you. Well, maybe one question, final question from Matt. And if you want to give a final reading, otherwise I, I can, we can have one more question after this. So Matt asks, can you comment on differing indigenous views of potential oil development in Alaska's Arctic National Wildlife Refuge? The Gwich'in Indians oppose it as a risk to the migratory caribou on which they depend. Dominant political leadership of Inupiat in the North Slope Borough support oil development as it produces huge local revenues that fund modern improvements in their communities. Yeah, this is a super complicated, um, it's it's complicated between communities and it's complicated within communities. And so I, I hesitate to make much more of a statement than that. Um, my sense also is that there's a big generational difference. Um, I know quite a few young Inupiaq folks who are not particularly keen on oil development because while it does produce jobs, it produces, you know, short-term seasonal rough jobs, right? They're not necessarily um, jobs that people are, are interested in, but that's not universal. Um, it's a really, it's a, it's a tough issue. And I think in some ways stems from the real failure in the United States to support uh, indigenous communities full stop, right? Um, you know, the, the people whose land we are living on are not people who are acknowledged in any kind of direct remunerative way for the most part. Um, and, you know, that leaves communities in a situation of, of having to take what jobs can show up. And sometimes those are not the ones that they want, it just happens to be the ones that that might present themselves. So it's a, it's a complicated, um, historically fraught, issue that, you know, goes back to the colonization of Alaska um, and goes back to really complicated relationships between the Inupiaq and the Gwich'in. Um, you know, I, I first lived in a, in a Gwich'in community in the Arctic and then spent a lot of time in Inupiaq country and my Gwich'in friends, you know, tease me for having gone and spent a bunch of time with folks who historically they've had some, you know, they had some good times with and some, some complicated times with, um, you know, long before Europeans showed up. So, um, I think the layers of history in that question go really deep. You could write an entire book um, just about the the dynamics that come to play there and and how complicated the presence of an extractive industry is in in you know in any community, right? They're they're complicated if it's in North Dakota, it's complicated if it's in the shale in Texas, it's complicated if it's you know in the north slope of Alaska. How, um, since you, you've mentioned you're from Iowa, um, is, it, is it challenging to work with indigenous com communities coming from the lower 48 as you do? Um, I mean, I think, I think it should be challenging in the sense that, um, you know, you shouldn't assume that you can just walk in and have people want you to be there. Um, and I think that's true if you're from the lower 48 or if you're, if you're from Alaska, right, um, you know, being an outsider to the community means that you need to be really careful and cognizant about that relationship. Um, I think the fact that, you know, I have spent a lot of time in the North and am not, you know, I'm not there to judge people for eating whales, which is not unfortunately always the case. And I'm not there to, you know, 
I don't have a like a proselytizing position on on any particular thing, right? Um, that's very helpful, right? My agenda is essentially to to try to you know write these communities into histories where they're often not. Um, so that that helps, but I you know it, it is it is challenging and it, it's challenging to do it right, and it's a thing that I think about you know large portions of every day as I start another project, thinking about kind of how to how to use the set of skills I have in a way that's beneficial to these communities and not writing over the fact that there are local, you know, historians and knowledge keepers and, you know, folks who may or may not, you know, need me to be telling a history in a particular way. Um, so it's a good question. Yeah, actually this, this one sort of comes off of that. Has the story tra telling traditions of the indigenous groups influenced your writing, especially about Perinju in a certain way? Yeah, I think one thing that, um, and I, I write a little bit about this in the, there's a note on sources in the back of the book. Um, one thing that I really took from many um, traditions in kind of both the Russian and the American side um, is an attitude toward stories where they are, um, they, they're a thing that you are responsible for passing on. They're not a thing that you claim um, full control over there's, you know, you're a particular teller for a while. Right. Um, and some people are really good at being a teller and some people are not so good, or some people are funny and some people are serious. Um, but it's a thing that you have a responsibility to giving to other people. Um, and in that act of giving part of the responsibility of the storyteller is to not tell people how to think all the time, right. Is to leave enough, complexity and ambiguity that when the next person takes up the story, they are doing the work of thinking with it themselves. Um, and then they hand it on to the next person. Um, and I found that a particularly um, kind of compelling way to approach historical situations where there are multiple con and often conflicting accounts of a particular event. Um, and I don't have any capacity to, to state unequivocally which one is the one that happened, right? There's, there's real moments in here where I will have an account, say from you know, a, a group of Soviet uh, you know, folks in the Red Army who are sent out to kind of subdue what to them is a rebellion from Chukchi reindeer herders. Um, it's very straightforwardly just a, a violation of the law. It's going against what the Soviet project is trying to do. It's provoked. Um, it's unnecessarily violent. You know, that's one kind of clearly articulated version of events. Um, and then you have, you know, a Chukchi oral history version or versions that come through court testimony that are saying, you know, these Soviet people, they showed up on our land. They started taking our reindeer. You know, they burned our sleds so that we couldn't move in the wintertime. And that's a total death sentence. Like we didn't have any other choice. Um, and, you know, in those two, there's very little overlap, right? There's a lot of daylight between those stories. Um, and in thinking about the ways in which, you know, I had heard storytellers kind of give you simultaneous versions of events that were different. In the book, I just leave the two of them next to each other. Um, and in some ways I leave it to the reader or to, you know, some future researcher who maybe finds something or knows something I don't to, to arbitrate that um, because it, it's a place where I don't have the authority. Um, and I think that being willing to reckon with the places where you don't have authority um, while also giving the information, right? It doesn't prevent you from relaying it. It just prevents you from saying that you are the final word um, was really, it was a helpful way to, to think about writing history. The, the chorus of voices that comes clearly through in your book. It's wonderful. I think, um, unless, would you like to read something short towards the end? I, I think those questions are fabulous and I really appreciate you taking the time to answer them so thoughtfully. Yeah, of course. It's, it's truly my pleasure. Um, I might read from the very, very end since that seems like a, a fitting place to close. Um, Historians are reticent to predict the future, but two things speak out from Beringia's past. One is the inconsistency between human desire and material outcome. People are only part of what shapes action. The other is that big oil will return to drill eventually if it is permitted to 
and if we ask it with our demand for energy. The market, after all, is not external to us, but the aggregate of action. The first requires recognizing the limits of human choice. The second, our power. The energy that sustains us is made by other beings, but energy is also what we put into the world with our labor and thought. It demarcates what matters as we transform matter. In doing so, we cannot decide all of what will come to pass, but we can decide what we value, the scales on which we conceive life and consume death. The continuous work of the imagination, Barry Lopez wrote from Gamble, Alaska 30 years ago, is to bring what is actual together what, with what is dreamed. What do we dream now in our global masses? Imagining another politics, one not so covetous of all energy and so bent on the fictions of enclosure, one not so blind to our place in the family of things might be a start. We can still wager on the world that we wish to compose. Wow, that's beautiful. It's Taylor, I'm back here at the end. Joe, anything at the end or are you handing back to me? I'm handing it back to you. That was beautiful. Thanks Bathsheba for the conversation. Thank you, Joe, so much. Yeah, that was just a fascinating conversation and a great way to spend the middle of the day on this ghost at least. So it only remains to me to um, close this up first by thanking some people. First and foremost, you Bathsheba for the book, and all the thoughtfulness and research that went into it. And it really has been kind of a shared experience and touchstone here at the Gund Institute over the last year or so as we've um, done this competition, but also just uh, decided on a winner and shared it with the community. So thanks so much both for the book and also to give us something to think about and talk about together as a Gun Institute community. Um, I also wanna thank everyone who got us here, you know, the, the co-chairs of this process, Joe and Josh, the judges and students who did all this. I also just looked it up and I wanna thank the donors who have built up the endowment for the Zen C Prize, who at current count number 161. So that is just a statement like no other about the breadth of people who worked with, respected, loved, and still do Eric Zensi. So many people decided large and small to contribute to this ongoing honor for him. So, and that number is growing um, so that this prize can grow and strengthen. So thanks to all those people. I love how big that number is and everyone else that um, who made this kind of event possible. So the last thing I wanna say is next fall, we will be announcing the next call for the Zensi Prize. It's an every two year thing, but it takes a while to get done. So please um, think about authors, pieces you think would be great candidates, but also um, keeping in touch with us as we go through this process. I just put in the chat, the place to keep up with Gun Institute events, just like this one. So if you're interested in staying involved through this and lots of other activities, that's where you go to learn about them. And one more final time, thanks and congratulations to Bathsheba and thanks for spending so much time with us. Thank you, thank you all. Okay, that wraps it up everybody. Thanks to all of you for attending and participating and sending in great questions and um, have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye everybody. <laughs>